As the woman turned to look back at the darkened grocery store, she clutched her child to her chest. With this warm air circulating the vehicle and the gentle hum of the engine, the baby was being lulled to a state of peace, where its crying ceased and its mother's tears began. Can we go back to help the others? She asked hoarsely. She asked hoarsely, her eyes glued on the increasingly shrinking structure. Ash frowned. He wasn't sure what to say. But as the sentient storm began to slither back toward the store, and though still trapped inside, he thought they both knew the answer to that question. It hurt to abandon them, but saving her had almost cost him his life. What could they do? Ten people wouldn't fit in the car. They would only perish in the effort. It made him feel queasy to leave them for dead. But as the storm enveloped the building, it became a little easier to accept. My name is Ashraf, but everyone calls me Ash, he said with a trembling voice, trying to change the subject, as if instead that were the question she had asked him. She digested what his response had meant, deflating a little into the seat, acceptance weighing heavily. She understood why they wouldn't go back, but she hated it all the same. Jolene, and this is Alice. She punctuated her reply by putting her hand on the child's head. It's a pleasure to meet you both. He forced a wan smile in their direction. How's it been out there? It's been hell in the town. Memories of the panic began to bubble back up within Jolene. Visions of the screams from friends and family and blood in the snow. People she had known her entire life that were now just gone. Like the flick of a switch, she would never be able to hug them or share gossip and meals again. Flashes of the cops being quickly overwhelmed as hot lead proved no match for the icy abomination. A tour through the citizens of Bear Creek. It had all happened so fast. Quiet, he responded. This place has been the first sign of life I've seen all night. I've seen a fair number of downed cars. I've seen places where people ought to have been. But so far, nothing. Then silence resumed its reign as they both thought over the other's answer. They listened to the shrieking gust that shook the car as they simultaneously realized perhaps it was worse out there than either of them had feared. They drove into the night. As the town of Bear Creek shrunk into the distance, nobody said a word. The only utterance was the occasional babble from Alice. But as the motion of the car lulled her to sleep, that died away too. Soon they were on the open road again. Ash had no new destination in mind, only the commanding instinct to keep moving. Jolene held her sleeping child tightly, as if the small body were a light to ward off the encroaching bleakness that threatened to swallow them. No signs of life emerged from the road as they crept along. Ash held the wheel with white knuckles so they did not slide on the treacherous pavement, slicked with ice and a growing layer of snow. Jolene simply stared out at the ever-raising dunes of white that encroached on the road. Thank you for what you did back there, she said softly into the window. Ash glanced at Jolene. I wouldn't have been able to forgive myself if I hadn't tried to do... Well, something. She nodded. I wish I could have done more, he said wistfully. She nodded again. Don't we all? A storm like this really makes you feel like an ant. A frozen, miserable ant. Jolene let out a dry little laugh. So where are these ants headed to now? 
Honestly, I have no idea. We have a little less than half a tank left. I don't know these roads. I was just driving until hopefully I found civilization. But well, you know the rest. Well, I know these roads. I grew up here and I think we could probably make it to the city on half a tank. It might be tight, but it isn't impossible. Ash perked up. Really? He asked with a glint of hope in his voice. If we follow this road until we hit Mason Road, there's an there's an on-ramp onto the throughway. From there, it's essentially a straight shot to the city. Ash grinned. He felt good about having some kind of plan that wasn't driving aimlessly until they ran out of gas. They drove on, the howling winds and torrents of white crystals their only traveling companions. Jolene tried the radio once more, but was greeted only with static and fragments of an emergency broadcast recording. Finally, they hit Mason Road. Ash made the turn slowly and deliberately, terrified of spinning out or missing the way hidden under so much snow. But the tires found their mark, and soon they were headed toward the highway. With only the headlights for guidance, they almost missed the on-ramp. Ash eased into a slow turn, but even that caused the car to slide on the slick road. The ice was becoming thick and insidious, denying the tires solid purchase. They came close to sliding into the guardrails. The brake desperately grinded against the slippery floor, only stopping the car mere inches away from the icicle-laden steel fence. Ash sighed in relief. Old Jolene mouthed a silent prayer. Her baby stirred in the commotion, but did not wake. They crept their way onto the lightless highway. The snow was beginning to pile high, and Ash wondered how long they would be able to even keep moving. He thought of the plow by the side of the road still flashing its yellow lights. With a heavy heart and gritted teeth, he knew that no help was coming. How the world was now was as good as it would get. When they finally pulled onto the highway, they were greeted by the ghostly outlines of dozens of cars, littering the way like a swarm of dead insects that had been hit with noxious toxins. They lay pell-mell where fate had struck. The bulk of the vehicles were on the opposite side. The only one the bulk of the vehicles were on the opposite side, the one leaving the city. The sight sat like a stone in Ash's stomach. We still want to do this, right? Ash whispered, not taking his eyes off of the frozen chaos. We know what's back there. I don't think we have much choice. I think we know what's up there, too, he grimaced. The child snored softly, oblivious to their plight. They began to move again. They began to move again, navigating around the abandoned cars with difficulty. Many of them had turned sideways, or were crooked, like they had been forced to slam to an unexpected stop. Why do you think so many of them have their windshields broken in like that? asked Jolene. Ash hadn't noticed that fact until she had pointed it out, but it was true. Most of the but it was true. Most of the vehicles they slithered past had shattered windows. Some even had crushed in roofs. Maybe it was the storm? Like what happened back in town? Maybe, she responded with a hint of doubt. The drive on the highway was difficult. The drive on the highway was difficult. So far they had been lucky. The down cars and trucks littered their path. The down cars and trucks littered their path, but hadn't made the way impassable. As the group made their way around the vehicular corpses, a new sound began to penetrate through the storm. It was far away, but it sounded like glass being crunched and mangled. 
The noise was followed by another, a groaning, metallic echo. Did you hear that? Jolene asked, clutching Alice closer. Jolene asked, clutching Alice closer to her. What do you think that was? A look passed between them that confirmed that both... A look passed between them that confirmed they were both in the dark. But the crunching din continued to drift through the whistling winds. Now it was distinctly closer. Neither of them were keen on finding out what was making the ghastly clang and crunch. Jolene was beginning to regret suggesting the highway. She clutched the sleeping Alice as if she should She clutched the sleeping Alice as if she didn't. The baby would melt away. They continued to drive. The monstrous crunching and cracking continued. With the occasional moan of steel punctuating the nerve-wracking noise, screams of ice and metal were drawn closer, and the inhabitants of the car did their best to ignore it, pretending that if they didn't acknowledge the unknown horror, then it couldn't touch them. The storm was intensifying as they made their way through the maze of mangled vehicles. Jolene shuddered after seeing a sedan that was missing the entire top of the car's cabin. Twisted metal and snow-covered seats sat exposed to the squall's fury. Twisted metal and snow-covered seats sat exposed to the squall's fury. Their crawl came to a dead stop. Jolene hadn't noticed, too enraptured in the mystery of the mutilated cars. Ash stared out of the windshield, slack-jawed and trembling. Do you see these cars? What could have done this? Jolene asked in a voice thick with worry. For a long moment, Ash sat in silence, too terrified to say a word. It was then that Jolene realized they had stopped. Why aren't we moving? She craned her head back to look at Ash saw his deathly pallor and wide-eyed horror, then followed the line of his gaze. All of her questions were answered in an instant. She didn't understand what she was looking at, but knew whatever was in front of them had ruined the cars around them and made their occupants disappear. The high beams of the sedan could hardly penetrate the swirling icy mist, but even still, they could just barely make out the signs of life before them. Inhuman movement and shapes unknown to any animal on earth played against the white curtain like a shadow puppet. What appeared to be endless tall columns of ice stood before them. The cylindrical glaciers rose and disappeared into the storm above them, as if If it were not for the fact that they moved with purpose, I should have thought them to be frozen over telephone poles. But they were thicker than that, and when one lifted it was clear they came to a harsh, sharpened point. One of the mammoth stalks prodded the truck in front of them like a child might poke at a sleeping animal. The creature took its massive appendage... (coughs) The creature took its massive appendage and placed it against the sedan's windshield. The slightest pressure from the frozen hull caused the glass to shatter. Then the stock journeyed inside the car's cabin and rooted around inside. Ash thought, Ash thought it looked like it was trying to get at the last cookie in the box. He grimaced when he realized the people in the car were the snacks it craved. A scream pierced the air as the behemoth found what it was looking for. Steel groaned and lungs. Steel groaned and lungs shrieked as the stock was ripped up through the hood. The beast was carrying its prize by what looked like frosted blue worms that had emerged from the bottom of its gigantic member. The strange blue tubes formed an alien and writhing fist. Its prey looked bloodied and feeble as it was lifted out of the massive vehicle as it was lifted out of the massacred vehicle. Jolene couldn't tell if it had been a man or a woman, but prayed for them all the same. Her liturgy fell. 
her liturgy fell on deaf ears as he entered the creature rays. Her liturgy fell on deaf ears as the creature raised its prey high into the air. The snow obscured what happened next. All I could see were the shadows of long tendrils and the opaque winds, and the drip of warm blood running down into the frozen pavement. Onto the frozen pavement. A wordless exchange passed between Ash and Jolene, and they knew they needed to escape right that instant. Curiosity had melted into raw terror, and now neither of them wanted to see any more of the gargantuan monstrosity that scraped the clouds. But as Ash searched for a route out, he made an awful realization. The prying stalks were many, and they were blocking all of the paths around the slaughtered cars. They were trapped. Hot panic began to bubble up within him like coffee in a percolator. He was wringing the steering wheel in his hands. Jolene came to the same realization. We can't get through, she whispered in defeat. We can't stay here though. That thing will open up this car like a tuna can. Jolene shrugged wearily. She knew he was right, but didn't know what else to say. Maybe if we play dead, it will leave us alone, Ash asked hopefully. It didn't seem to help them much. Ash grimaced. Well, that's all we have right now. With that, he flipped the headlights off, leaving them in darkness. They were left in the pitch blackness of the concrete graveyard. The lamps that had lit the highway for decades had gone out hours ago. Now only moonlight eliminated the tundra in a quiet blue light. Sight was limited to only a few ghostly inches outside the vehicle, where the snow danced at spectral waltz. Fear congealed in the hearts of the inhabitants of the sedan, sitting in the cobalt gloom. Aside from the baby Alice, who slept obliviously and contentedly in the car's engine's purr, the sound of the wind was punctuated by the colossal footsteps of the many-legged alien beast that had claimed the interstate as its new hunting ground. They exchanged a glance when it felt as if the pounding on the ground was drawing closer, the sedan rocking with every monstrous step. Ash had thought that turning off the headlights would make them safer. Instead, that just made them blind. He slowly moved his hand to the end of the stick where the knob to control the light sat. Clumsy fingers found their mark. He gently twisted the headlights back on. Ash and Jolene shrieked. Baby Alice soon joined the bawling, the massive column of ice was mere feet away from them now. An inhuman guttural shriek consumed their pitiful an inhuman guttural shriek consumed their pitiful cries from far above. The mammoth arm lifted and swung toward them. The icy snaky appendages emerging from the many holes to explore for more food. Still screaming, Ash shifted the car into reverse and slammed his foot onto the gas. The car's wheels squealed and skidded in place on the ice before finding any. The car's wheels squealed and skidded in place on the ice before finding enough purchase to rocket backward. The pillar of ice and tentacles crushed down on where they had been idly mere moments before. Jolene swiveled her head back and began calling out directions. Ash was too blinded by terror to pay attention to anything other than getting away from the frozen god bounding toward them. Car on your left! Ash craned the wheel to the right. Right! She cried. He spun to the left. They worked in tandem to avoid the cars they had just so painstakingly crept by. However, the creature was still gaining. The icy road littered with metallic corpses and was working against them. It could easily push aside the mechanical husks in pursuit of another meal. Break! She slammed. Ash slammed on the brakes. The car skidded and began to fishtail. 
until the side of the vehicle crashed into a downed van. The impact rocketed the car. The impact rocked the car and everyone inside. Alice was bawling with force. Her mother was on the verge of doing the same. Out of the driver's side window, Ash could see at least eight of the imposing columns stamping toward them, knocking cars and trucks off the road with abandon. Then he saw it, a narrow but clear path, free of the thunderous legs or overturned vehicles. He spun the wheel and hit the accelerator. The wheels cried until they finally started grabbing traction. The sedan peeled off the van like a bandage from a scab, leaving paint in the passenger side mirror behind. The engine whined as Ash sped up. The rumbling shriek from the flurries above rained down on them and as they flew down the highway. The rumbling shriek from the flurries above rained down on them as they flew down the highway. Ash screamed in response, but the battered sedan didn't stop and slipped through the first pair of colossal legs. As they drove under the vast beam, the light grew dimmer as it blotted out the moon. As they slunk under the massive being for the first time, Jolene was truly awestruck by the scale of the beast, not just in fear, but the same kind of wonder that hit her when looking at a mountain or an ocean. They were under a tidal wave of life that dwarfed them. But eventually, they were able to shoot out from under the behemoth. They could hear the crash of tremendous legs hitting the pavement, but neither looked back. They just kept driving, hoping that they had made it clear that they were not a meal worthy of the effort to catch them. After ten minutes of driving, far too fast, and weaving past down cars and several near misses, they no longer heard the earth-shaking steps. Once more, all that could be heard was the piercing shriek of the wind. For the first time that night, both drew comfort in the sound. It took longer still for the adrenaline to fade. Then the, then the enormity of the calamity that had befallen them began to set in. Whatever was happening was more than a mere storm. Something had changed. The world was different now. Neither of them liked how they fit into the new frozen landscape. Ash eyed the gas tank. They had less than a quarter of a tank left now. He tried to put it out of his mind, but the weight of it being, sh but the weight of being stranded out on the highway snared around him. Then Jolene said what they had been too afraid to. Then Jolene said what he had been too afraid to. Do you think we'll make it? Definitely, he said in a quavering voice that didn't even convince himself. They drove with a pensive silence filling the small space. The only solace as they cut through the night was that the storm was beginning to lift. The sky was still heavy with gray clouds, but the snowfall around them fell to a white trickle of its former bluster. With the newfound visibility, they both searched for any signs of rescue, for any weak flicker of humanity out in the darkness. Jolene found nothing, except she did spot shifting forms in the clouds above. Something huge and serpentine slid over itself entrenched in the dark nimbuses. The sight made her clench her teeth in fear. She said nothing and brought her eyes back down to earth. Deep in the pit of her stomach, an unpleasant truth was blossoming within her. This was no longer the world it had been mere hours ago. Life had changed. She looked down at her child, now bright-eyed and awake, but uncomprehending of the nightmare that had encircled them. Jolene knew that whatever happened, I could not keep up. From the grim look of determination on Ash's face, he hadn't come to the same conclusion she had. It didn't matter, she thought. Let him hope. Let him hope enough for both of them. She settled into the plush passenger seat. Instinctively, she bounced her baby gently on her knee, then shut her eyes. 
Ash glanced at Jolene, a twinge of envy for her ability to seem so calm. Even with the drive getting easier, his nerves had been eviscerated. His fists continued to tremble no matter how tightly he gripped the wheel. He continued to look for light, for life he recognized. A voice inside him told him it had to be out there, that whatever calamity had befallen them was surely only temporary. But as they started to near the city and the sprawling suburbs, that certainty began to waver. The rows and rows of homes all sat silently in thick blackness, dead like driftwood poking out of the ocean. But still, he clung to hope. He thought he saw signs of movement in the neighborhoods below. But it didn't look human. It was too fast and scuttling to be anything he could name. He willed his eyes away from the scurrying shadows and onto the road in front of him, blocking out all but the asphalt, concrete, and ice before him. Time passed like this until the gas gauge was closing in on the strip of red that heralded the end. Time passed like this until the gas gauge was closing in on the strip of red that heralded the end. Counting down the minutes of life they had left with each tick, Ash could feel the hand of death coming down faster every second, waiting to cut through their lives with an effortless touch. Jolene and Amanda dozed. Jolene and Alice dozed in the passenger seat beside them. Jolene and Amanda dozed on the passenger seat beside him. He wondered if he had done them any kindness by saving them back in town, or if he'd just given them a momentary stay of execution. Finally, he saw the green sign announcing that they were within the city limits. The sign bid them welcome, but left Ash feeling hollow. He hadn't noticed in his driving days, but they were being encroached upon by the steel sanctuary as he had dreamed of it from the start of this nightmare. However, there were still no lights. The city had none of the revelry and activity he knew from only hours before. <sighs> it had thick jackets of snow, and smashed-in cars greeted him. Only thick jackets of snow and smashed-in cars greeted him. Are we here? Ash jumped. He had noticed Jolene waking up. With a solemn nod from him, Jolene knew it was something she needed to know. She tried to swallow in a dry mouth. Alice was awakened from the commotion and stretched out her tiny limbs in her mother's lap. Jolene frowned as she looked at the buildings. They were dark and silent as tombs, and climbed in the night all around them. Nobody home, she asked sheepishly. Nobody home, she asked sheepishly. Not so far. Not so far. His voice thick with despair. How's the gas? He shook his head in response. She knew then that this was it. This was the end of the line. The last terminal was as dead and frozen as the first. The dashboard began to blink with an urgent red hue. The gas was nearly gone. Well, at least we tried. She said with a pitiful smile. Yeah, at least we tried, he said, bringing the car to a stop. He thought it would be better to save what le he thought it would be better to save what was left to keep the car running, keep the heat with them as long as they could. Jolene stayed silent and just rocked her daughter, giving her small kisses on her little forehead. Alice giggled. Light began to peek through the steel and concrete labyrinth. Dawn was ascending on the new world it would now lower it over. Light was beginning to peek through the steel and concrete labyrinth. 
dawn was ascending on the new world it would now lord over. A terrible roar from inhuman vocal cords echoed through the city. Jolene grabbed Ash's hand and put her thumb in Alice's tiny grip. If the end had arrived, at least they would not face it alone. This concludes The Snow is Hungry, written and narrated by Remy Militello. I truly hope you enjoyed this frozen tale of terror, and I hope it brings you a little warmth as the days get closer, as the days get shorter, and the nights get longer. Please join me next week for more horror content. Please join me next week for more good horror stuff. And until then, stay safe, stay spooky, and have a horrifying week.